Hello everybody and welcome to What's Next, our podcast and blog series where we talk about startups and innovation. My name is Giovanni Vacari, I am head of product here at Startup Bootcamp and today it is my pleasure to interview our mentor and super expert, Jasper Etema. Welcome Jasper. Thank you Gio, thank you for having me, I'm really pleased to be here. Well, we're very happy to have you here because you're an expert in entrepreneurship, startups, VCs, but also I hear that you're an expert in pitching. Is that correct? Yeah. Then if you're good at pitching, I would like to ask you, put you on the spot. Can you give us a quick pitch on who is Jasper Atema? I don't need 90 seconds. I can just tell you whenever you know a founder in trouble, call me. That, that was a very quick one. Nice. Succinct, self-explanatory. You have been now working with entrepreneurship for quite some years. How did it start? Well, um, you know, it started like, I think it was like 15 years ago. I was working for an industrial company and um, they used to make toys, but um, the company went bankrupt. And then mm. I was discussing this with my friends and uh, discussing the situation. Um, and they just told me, hey, why don't you just make a management buyout? And that was the first time that I realized that I could actually own and run a company. So I planned a management buyout, which didn't work out, but it <laughs> doesn't matter. Uh, within these two weeks of planning uh, the entire buyout and, and actually engaging with uh, the lawyers and, and in the entire process, I actually found out that this is something I really like. And uh, that's where the entire journey started. And now we're like a couple of startups uh, later and a couple of spin-offs later. And um, yeah, here I am. And what excites you about it that you've been doing it for so long? Well, first of all, about my own entrepreneurship activities, it's like, um, first of all, taking your own decisions and having to really, um, um, yeah, to be accountable for it, but then also being able to uh, realize your own ideas, right? Not the ideas of somebody else, your own ideas, right? And, and that's a great difference. Um, yeah, that, that's what. And then, of course, when it comes to my job now, where I have to do with a lot of founders, um, they're just such inspiring people with so much energy and so much positivity. So much drive. Actually, so much drive, exactly. And, uh, and I also feel that as an maybe slightly more experienced entrepreneur, I am somewhat um, obliged to guide these powers in the right direction where it goes to doing good for the planet, you know, uh, doing good for society. So I think actually our job as mentors is to make sure that the energy these people have and the ideas that they have end up doing something good. Yeah, because it, it, cannot, it's, it's, it has a power of a rocket. Right, but you have to chart a good direction there because they have so much drive and so much power that we need to make sure that they're still following on the right. Uh. You know, Gio, this is actually why I'm wearing my rocket socks today. Oh, okay. For those that are not watching, I'm he wearing is wearing rocket socks. Rocket socks. Rocket socks. Oh, those are so cool. Uh, are, for, are they from uh, Happy Socks? No, they're, I, I don't know because uh, it was a gift. It was oh, a gift nice. after doing workshop. So uh, I did a workshop on, on pitching and uh, the customer gave me those and said they'll, they'll, they'll fit you perfectly. Oh, that's and so they nice. Do. They do. And well, but not everything goes up like a rocket. I'm sure you also have some, some sad stories to tell. What about when things didn't go so well? You know, I've lost companies myself, right? So um, I've never had the fortune to do a really large exit. I have exited some companies of mine, but not like in dimensions where uh, the romantics of startup industry actually want you to be. Yeah. Um, you know, it's all about how you deal with this. Um, some ideas just don't work out. Most of them don't work out early, but some of them don't work out late. That's fine, right? Yeah. So uh, it's just a matter of how do you deal with this? And I can just say, um, the idea we had back then is still available. We can still launch it if we want to, if the market is ready for it. The people that worked on it all have good jobs now and are very grateful for the time that they have uh, in, in the startup. Um, so I think everybody everybody's fine, right? Yeah, and it, it, that's really important that you say because sometimes it doesn't matter how hard you work, it's just not the right moment for that idea. Yeah, we the were definitely too early. And um, um, for me, it's also 
really important to evaluate my own role in this, right? Because, you yeah. know, I was at the steering wheel. So, uh, and I've identified some, uh, some failures that I did um, that actually also caused uh, this company to fail. But, um, you know, I've learned from that. And that's exactly part of the experience that I can now provide to other founders. Yeah. And, and both types of, of feedback are extremely valuable on successes and as well on, let's call it a big quota, failures. But um, what do you think was the secret recipe in the things that went right, in the ventures that did go well? Well, I think basically back then when I started, there was no such, such thing as lean startup, right? Nobody knew what it was or... Um, But, you know, lean startup, the cycle of, of um, uh, plan, execute, measure, right? It's like um, everybody has been doing this. You just have to look at quality management. The, the, the Chinese automotive uh, constructors have been doing this for ages, right? It's just a matter of like, like planning what I'm going to do, do it, and then evaluate what I did. And that's... I actually the cycle of life. So this is something that we implemented in, in the companies that I ran, um, uh, like in every stage of the company, like from day one. Nice. And I think that that brings me to my next point, which is as well, doing that is not enough, knowing how to sell that as well is such a key part because you can have the best idea, but if you can't communicate it, and I hear so many founders <coughs> saying, oh, but I can't make this in a minute and a half. My startup, my idea is too complex for that. What do you have to say about, you know, those people that say, oh, my idea is too complex for a 90 second pitch? You know, um, pitching workshops is actually something, some of my specialties, right? I've, I've got a really good uh, pitch workshop at the start and, and the customers that I uh, serve with this are really pleased because it's something different from the things that actually offered uh, on the market. Um, and it basically, always starts with the acknowledgement that any idea is useless if you cannot communicate it. Now, I'm not saying you can sell it, right? Selling and communicating are two different things, or maybe um, selling is part of communicating, right? It's a special niche maybe, right? But also at idea stage, you have to communicate your idea to find co-founders. You have to communicate your idea to actually get feedback, you know? How will you get feedback from mentors if you're not able to actually communicate your idea? So this is very, very crucial. And this is why I have designed two methodologies, one for um, idea stage startups and one for pre-seed seed stage startups that actually, um, that actually allow a founder to acquire the skill of pitching. So... This is something different from just preparing someone for a demo day, right? Yeah. So getting like a pitch professor in for uh, a, a day, one moment, for one moment, tailored to one event, and after that you're you're lost. Uh, it's more about developing a skill, and um, I've been doing this with uh, some accelerators for uh, a couple of uh, years actually uh, by now. And these actually the, the feedback that I get is that the average quality of the pitches is actually higher. Mm -hmm. So, and there are less uh, bad pitches and there's still enough good pitches. So um, the average quality of the pitch is higher, of the, the pitches overall is higher, um, which actually makes the entire accelerator more sellable to investors, right? Um, and investors um, actually dis discover better investment opportunities. And I think for startups, it's also so important because often when you are in an accelerator, you are as well pitching next to 10 other st amazing startups or nine other amazing startups. Mm -hmm. And it can be so hard to be startup number seven <laughs> on the lineup of pitches and still be memorable and still call for people's attention. What do you think is the most important part when you're pitching to already grab people's attention in that first 30 seconds? You know, this is actually one of the main things that, that startups um, must be must dare to do. Um, most of the startups jumpstart. Jumpstarting is one of the, the most common failures in pitching. You know, you show up at, stage, at the stage and you start to talk. Why not just wait for five seconds 
you know, for everybody to actually acknowledge that you're standing there and that you're about to say something and then you do your opener, but not immediately. And most of the times that works perfectly fine, right? Yeah. And, and sometimes other occasions need other solutions, but this is exactly what we need to teach our founders, that different occasions need different solutions. Yes. And that's what it's about. Just how you wouldn't send the same pitch deck, right? For every single type of client or customer that you have, you, you tailor the story. Exactly. That, that's, of course, very important. Um, but before that, there's also the acknowledgement that um, there are different pitch decks for different occasions. The deck that you send cannot be the same as a deck that you present. No. Uh, a lot of founders um, still do that, especially in early stages. They do this. Um, basically thinking we have one deck because if you research this in the internet you always get the feedback like the deck right oh yeah that you is know? true yeah so this is why a lot of young founders and, and early founders think there's just one deck but what would you say what would you say is the main difference between the deck you send and the deck you pitch the deck you present the deck you send must be self-explanatory so there is no question asked actually I think the younger generation startups do this in a video, yeah. you know, because it's actually better and it still features you, right? So, uh, but like people like me, I have hard times using video as a medium. I really have hard times. So uh, I would just send a deck that is really simple and the key is less is more, you mm -hmm. know? Less slides, less, so there can only be one statement, one slide, right? So there's no three statements on one slide or 10, you know. Um, I still see this a lot and it's just not understandable. Yeah. Um, I think it's also not competing, right? When you're presenting uh, and you're, when you're pitching and you're presenting with your slides, your slides shouldn't compete for the attention from you. If you have so much text, people are going to look at your text, not at you. Yeah, the key is that the slide is the visual aid. You know, yeah. you are the story, you tell your story and the slides support you with that. It's not the other way around. Yeah. Um, because what do investors or, or partners or potential customers want to, want to know? They want to know, are you likable in first instance, right? So is this something, are you um, someone that I like or that I could imagine doing a good product? Or is the thing you are presenting authentic? Does it fit to you, right? Is there the story that you're telling, the things that you're showing, do, do it fit to your personality as I am perceiving it? Because you do know, you do have your three criteria for a good pitch, right? What, what are those? Well, first of all, you have to be authentic. So if you are um, on stage, the first appearance needs to be, okay, this person is in the right place at the right time, right? This yeah. fits. Um, and then, of course, the idea has to make sense for the audience, which is like the idea that you present can make sense to another audience, but not to this one. You know? yeah. um, so that depends. And then, of course, persuasive. So at the end of the pitch, I want to be persuade to, persuaded to, to join you, to contribute something or to do, um, to actually follow your call to action, because every pitch ends with a call to action of some sort. And I think it's so important that you mentioned that they need to be with you in the story because I see so many founders that they think they're talking to everybody in their own industry and, and they don't give a clear understanding of why their problem is a problem. You know, if I'm not in the uh, smart energy uh, industry, I may not know what the problem is yeah. there. So I think situating and bringing everybody in the room, whether they're not going to, whether they're going to invest in you or not, make them understand why is that such a pressuring problem? think that there's so much richness in that and bringing people in this journey with you is very important. You know, you know, one of the things, especially in the methodology that I use for um, pre-seed and seed uh, stage startups is basically acknowledging the fact that you cannot be liked by everyone in the audience, no. right? So you have your specific part of the audience that you're addressing and these are the people you target and the rest it's just like, okay, it's entertainment, but it's not something you could expect something back from it, right? So imagine, for example, uh, uh, an audience of 100 investors. Of these investors, maybe 
20 will actually invest in, uh, in startups of your uh, industry. Then, of course, only 10 out of these 20 uh, actually think your idea is good of, due to experience that they have. Yeah. And then five of these 10 are actually able to invest because they have spare money. You know, because that's also an issue, right? Uh, investors have investment money to invest. So most yeah. of the time, their money is invested. Yeah. So, And also sometimes they just don't like you or your idea. And that's also fine. Or they're having a stressful day. I mean, you can't really please everybody. And that, that feedback on your pitch should never be a feedback on you as a founder. Should be maybe on the story, the way you're telling it, but uh, never on, on a personal level. I feel like that can be the case. No, of course not. And this is something um, you'd have to acknowledge quite early. Um, you need a lot of pitches to actually attach to people. <coughs> and um, one of the main things is actually the acknowledgement that um, there's no chance that uh, an investor will come up to you after you, the first pitch you've ever seen of you and then say, where can I sign? Oh, yeah, no. That's bogus, <laughs> you know? That, that's ridiculous. No, yeah. um, especially VCs, but also business angels tend to watch you for a amount of time, right? So like of for course. a couple of weeks, months, you know? So therefore, first of all, it is okay if you uh, do not go away from a pitch or a stage with a signed agreement, you know? Um, yeah. So don't expect too much, but still you should also be aware that your performance during this period has to be at least constant or continuous and the message that you actually present at your pitches has to show some traction so there has to be improvement from the first time the investment saw you and the last time he sees you right yeah. and if you don't do that nobody will ever invest right which is why it's so important as well to keep updating your pitch and not be afraid that you keep updating your pitch and not be like oh my god always constantly change. no that's a good thing exactly you're showing progress exactly and also showing coachability, mm. right? I keep hearing from a lot of investors and mentors, oh, this team is very coachable. Yeah, well, actually, um, Gio, I, I work with startups a lot, but I, I am mostly contracted by accelerators. So I, I actually work for accelerators and venture uh, funds uh, to support them supporting their startups. And this is actually what they feed back to me, right? So the accelerators actually feed back to me, okay, some people in the team are not so coachable, right? So what, yeah. could, what can we do? And um, most of the times it's a personal relationship kind of issue, mm -hmm. right? So uh, it's really important for an accelerator or for a VC to build up the relationship with the team to actually be uh, able to provide them with information, experience, knowledge, right? Yeah, and also knowing when to stop pitching. Because sometimes we are already convinced we need to hear from you how your business is actually doing. And I feel some, tar some startups are constantly in this pitch loop that they need to continuously convince. Yeah. How do you experience uh, when startups are keep, keep, keep just trying to sell themselves to you? Um. Or maybe I can phrase that better. Like how can a mentor or uh, somebody that wants to help the startup get the startup out of the loop of, okay, I already understood you and I buy you. Like, let's work together now. You know, there are two different situations in here because um, from a partnership side, if the, if, the, if the startup approaches me through an event, for example, then uh, yes, it can happen that they're trying to convince me all the time. But also then, um, obviously, there is not yet a relationship where we can have just an open talk. So. I'm doing something wrong as well, right? Um, uh, either point. I haven't said a clear no, or I didn't give some signals that, yeah, okay, I like it, but you know, I have some questions. Um, so they're still selling. Um, uh, on the other hand, when you're a mentor, right? Um, for a mentor, that means you're not asking the right questions, um, or you, the questions that you're asking are not actually received by the founder. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually one of the issues with mentorship, that a lot of mentors have really, really good knowledge, um, but are not able to transfer it. And for the startups on, we talked about, you know, being authentic and uh, being persuasive, right? Bringing people with the idea. Uh, these are things that they should do. But what do you think are the biggest mistakes that the startups currently make on pitching? 
Well, let's turn to idea stage startups, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they, they spend way too less time on explaining the problem, you know? Um, because every idea starts with a problem for which I have a solution, which is the idea, right? Um, and the problem that I have identified has been new to me. So how can I assume that somebody else that has not have the same idea identifies the problem as such immediately? You need a lot of time. There's this famous quote about Einstein, right? So he said, like, uh, if I have 60 minutes to, to, uh, to save my life, I would spend 55 minutes on trying uh, yeah. on, on, on the, the problem and fi five minutes on the solution. Um, that's basically it, right? So, uh, and, and yeah, afterwards, you can actually present an idea or a solution. And then the idea is not so much um, important because it's the solution that's the business, right? You can have an idea, but if you don't, uh, if you're not able to design or develop it into a product that is actually providing a solution to yeah. a party, like a consumer. Yeah, uh, to a problem, basically. Yeah. Um, then you're not able to sell it. Yeah. So an investor will always be interested in the solution and not in the idea. Also because, let's be honest, how many, especially in the early stage phase, the ideas are going to change. There's so much room still to pivot. And uh, as long as you're in love with the problem, and why is the problem so important for you that you're going to solve it? Yeah, the way you're going to solve it may change, but you're still you know, attached to that mission of solving it. Yeah, and, and it's very dangerous actually to have a lot of ideas without executing one. Indeed. So it's better to actually uh, execute a few ideas and learn from it than having many ideas. Agreed. So. Well, and now you're transferring all this knowledge. What inspired you to become a mentor? Well, um, back in 2018, I was hired by a corporate uh, in Austria mm -hmm. to design an accelerator. It was a global accelerator. It was really exciting. And nice. um, yeah, it was a really nice journey. We had a really cool team. I'm still working with a lot of uh, people from this team. Um, and um, yeah, that actually inspired me to focus on helping accelerators because uh, I then understood that accelerators are actually um, the, um, how do you say it? They're the boosters for a startup, right? Mm -hmm. So you can make so much uh, progression in these couple of yeah. weeks or months that you are in an accelerator if you use it the right way, if there's a good fit. Um, yeah, the, the, this is actually quite an intense time and being able to help founders during this int intense time is a really nice thing to do. And you're now with Startup Bootcamp for how long? Since this summer. Nice. Um, so uh, yeah, actually um, I've been targeting uh, Startup Bootcamp quite on purpose actually. Um, and then uh, Patrick Dezeo uh, matched me up with Liz and Liz got me into the sustainability uh, uh, program, which I actually quite like. Uh, and it's just such a special program, you know. If you see only the, the way it's designed by itself with the IPO and the people that engage with it, it's just amazing. Uh, and the dynamics are just great. So, thank you. I'm so happy to be in. And you recommend it to other mentors. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. And uh, what is the difference then in helping the startups that are impact driven? Because they also need to pitch, they also need to sell, mm -hmm. um, but they are there for an impact. I don't like this entire discussion or separation between impact and social business and other business and common businesses, you know, because why separate them? Okay. You know, so, so. Of course, she can have a, like an accelerator with a sustainability touch. Okay, that's fine, right? But still, the business itself, I will never call my business a, um, an impact business or whatever because the problem is that in our world, an impact business tagged as such or a social business tagged as such does not, is not an investment case or a business by itself. You know what I mean? because of the tag that it has, that it is social. So it's for, it's for the good, you know? So it's like, it's like, 
you know you know what I mean right yeah. this is like so it it's it will not be as good a business as a uh, a common startup is which is actually bullshit yeah you know it's a business like any other yeah it's it a just business like happens any other. to help the environment or the planet or the people which every company should do actually actually there should be there should be a, there should be a um a word for companies destroying uh, <laughs> our planet or are doing bad to our society. That is right? a good one. The not not called these startups, yeah. the impact startups. We call the other ones the, the like, shitty ones. This is like, for example, in our food industry, right? If you look in the supermarket, the bio food that is actually the purest of the food that we have has to be named bio food and the rest is common food. But the common food has all these artificials. In artificials in it and whatever, pesticides and whatever, right? So that should so be the artificial it's the other way food. Around. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's the other way around. So well, that makes complete sense. And also, you know, if you want to change, I, I, I love startups that are out there for impact because, man, all you got to do is want to, you know, create your startup in an equal way. All you got to want to, to, to do is just want to. I just love that. You know, you can really make a change, whereas, you know, the government can take super long, a corporate can take much longer to inflict change, but a startup can go from the start already in a more beneficial way for the planet. So yeah. why not do that? I think innovation is the only way to save our planet. This is an acknowledgement that I had in the last three years that, is, that I was thinking about, okay, we've come so far with the Industrial Revolution, we've screwed up so far, so much, right? So why not use the same powers that actually brought us this far to actually turn it around? And Actually, I cannot understand why it is so hard to do. You know, you have this um, uh, this COP meeting in in in, in Glasgow, right? Yeah. Um, Where well, I think, yeah, why was it so easy to come this far and destroy so much, and why is it so hard to turn it around? Yeah, there is um, a, a quote from that that I really loved, which is, "If we individually can cause such instability." in the planet, we together can definitely uh, fix it. And I think that that was a really beautiful uh, call for, for, for action. Unfortunately, my call for ending is closing, but I do have one more, a few more questions, a fireside chat to ask you. Uh, sorry, fireside question. What is your favorite book now? Well, um, a, um, a person that I know within the local uh, ecosystem in Graz uh, just uh, gave me a book. Uh, and it's about uh, it's from an um, an Austrian uh, author about the startup scene. It's called Business Angels Devils, where the angels is, has a strike through it. So it's business devils uh, with all the insights how and how not and why not to engage with business angels. Um, I've only started reading it, but it's very promising, um, and I think it is very good when experienced entrepreneurs like the author, his, his name is Florian Kantler, actually tries to um, provide his knowledge to the ecosystem uh, in any way, and, and the book is just one way. Car or bike? Bike, bike. Hey, today I was traveling in by train on Amsterdam, and I have checked into my hotel and was here in the Jan Huizingalaan uh, within 45 minutes. That can only be done by bike. Right? That is true. That so is true. No bike, definitely. Plane or trains? Trains. I traveled here by train, the night train. Oh, it's so nice, right? I also you know, love it. Yeah. You know, I saved an entire day. If I would have flown in today, I'd be only be here like at 2 o'clock. Yep. Now, now I'm in at 11. Also, right, you know, so it's airport security. It's just I don't mind if I sleep at home or in the train. Indeed. What inspires you? Um, people with good ideas. What advice would you like to give to your 25-year-old self? Wow. Well, maybe take a little bit more advice here and there. And now he became a mentor. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much, Asper. It was a pleasure talking to you. It was my pleasure. This was What's Next. Feel free to follow us on Instagram at Starter Bootcamp and also to follow up uh, on our podcast. It is available everywhere great podcasts are found. See you next episode.